All right, so strep pyogenes, this is where it is in relation to the streptococci. Uh, you can see that it's beta hemolytic, so it co causes complete hemolysis uh, of blood agar, and there are two streptococci in this category, strep pyogenes and strep agalectiae. Let's go to the lab. Now, the first thing we'll see in the lab is beta hemolysis. So, complete breakdown of RBCs, and that's why you have these golden halos around the um, RBCs, around the colonies. And so, this tells us it's either strep pyogenes or a strep agalectiae, and we need to do more tests to differentiate between them. The first test we can do is something called the bacitracin test. And bacitracin is an antibiotic, and bacitracin inhibits strep pyogenes. So strep pyogenes is sensitive to bacitracin. That's why you see that big halo around it, uh, whereas strep agalectiae is resistant. Now, a third test we can do is something called the PYR test. Now, PYR is basically an enzyme that's found in strep pyogenes. Uh, it's got a long name, pyrolidinyl RLMDase. Uh, it's found in strep pyogenes and in enterococci. And so, with the enzyme, it'll break down a substrate and you'll end up with a pink colored test tube like the one on the right and that's a positive reaction. So to summarize what we know about strep pyogenes, it's beta hemolytic, it's bacitracin sensitive and it's PYR positive. And you need to know these for step one. All right, let's talk about some of the um, virulence factors of strep pyogenes. Uh, we'll give you some background about uh, how it causes diseases and it'll be easier to understand. So there are two important cell wall components and two exotoxins that help it cause disease. The first cell wall component is called C-carbohydrate and I've drawn it in the shape of C there. Now this carbohydrate is antigenic and it's used for the Lansfield classification. So the Lansfield classification is basically a way of classifying strep based on this C-carbohydrate that they have. They each have a different one. The carbohydrate in strep pyogenes makes it a group A um, strep. Now, just as a side note, um, not all the streptococci have C carbohydrate. So there are five clinically important streptococci. Two of them don't have this, the uh, C carbohydrate, and that's why they're just named um, as streptococcus pneumonia and strep viridens. They just have normal names. And the three groups that have this C carbohydrate, this is uh, strep uh, pyogenes, which is known as group A strep. You have strep agalectiae, which is group B strep, and then the group D uh, streptococci. So, another name for uh, strep pyogenes is group A strep or group A beta hemolytic strep. All right, the second cell wall component that's important is called the M protein. Now, I've drawn it like an M and M, so you can remember that. And the M protein uh, does two important functions as a virulence factor. Number one, M protein inhibits complement binding to the strep pyogenes cell, and so it inhibits phagocytosis. Now, this allows the bacteria to multiply rapidly in tissue, and this can help it cause necrotizing fasciitis. The second function of M protein, and this is important, is that it's antigenic. Just like C carbohydrate, it's antigenic. Now, this means that antibodies develop against M protein, and these antibodies will cross react with similar antigens on the heart, on myocardiocytes, and you can remember that M and myocardiocytes, and also with antigens um, in the brain, in the chordate nucleus. And you get the disease rheumatic fever. And rheumatic fever involves myocarditis, Sydenham's chorea, and other uh, symptoms which are grouped into the Jones criteria. And here is a 
scanning electron microscope of strep pyogenes and you can see these fuzzy frilly things on the edge and those are the M proteins All right so let's move on to the exotoxins there are two exotoxins the first of them is called streptolysin O and it's clinically relevant in two ways firstly streptolysin O from its name lyses RBCs and that's why strep pyogenes is beta hemolytic secondly you develop antibodies against streptolysin O and this is called the ASO titer, anti-streptolysin O titer. And this is used to indicate recent or current infection with group A strep. And therefore it will help you form your differential diagnosis. Alright, the second exotoxin is known as um, pyrogenic toxin or erythrogenic toxin. And it causes scarlet fever. Now scarlet fever, I remember it as scarflet fever because it comes with a rash and the rash starts at the neck and then it spreads to the trunk and extremities and it spares the face, it doesn't touch the face. Alright, so let's talk about the diseases, we've already covered some of them and it causes six diseases, strep pyogenes and again we can classify them. Two of the diseases are exotoxin mediated, we just talked about one of them, um, two of them are caused through direct tissue invasion and two are caused by antibodies. So let's start with the exotoxin mediated diseases. The first one which we just mentioned is scarlet fever and we said that uh, scarlet fever comes with a rash and the rash starts at the neck and then it goes down to the trunk and then it involves the extremities and it spares the face. This pattern is classic for scarlet fever and it can also come with a strawberry tongue so the tongue literally looks like strawberry so this is um, scarlet fever and you can see it just um, involves the neck like a scarf and then it goes down and this is strawberry tongue and yeah it looks like a strawberry alright so the second exotoxin mediated disease is called streptococcal toxic shock syndrome and basically, and this resembles the uh, Staph aureus uh, toxic shock syndrome. And it's basically mediated by a similar toxin which acts as a super antigen. So super antigens, they um, activate um, multiple T cells and from different clones and you have a huge inflammatory systemic response. Now direct invasion diseases. So the first disease caused by direct invasion is pharyngitis commonly known as strep pharyngitis. Now, this usually presents with tonsillar exudate, and in this case, you need to suspect group A strep pharyngitis because it can be complicated by rheumatic fever or post-strep glomerulonephritis, or PSGN for short. So this is a picture of strep pharyngitis, and you can clearly see the um, tonsillar exudate. Alright, second disease caused by direct invasion is skin infections such as folliculitis or cellulitis and this may be complicated by necrotizing fasciitis. Now the important thing to remember about skin infections is that it can cause post-strep glomerulonephritis. It can be complicated by that. Now the two antibody medi mediated diseases We've already talked about rheumatic fever and remember that it only occurs after strep pharyngitis, not after skin infections usually. The second antibody medi mediated disease is post-strep glomerulonephritis and basically what happens here is there's immune complex deposition, so antibody antigen deposition in the glomerular basement membrane and this results in uh, glomerulonephritis. Now, PSGN can occur after pharyngitis or after skin infection. It's important to remember this distinction. All right, so strep pyogenes. How do we treat strep pyogenes infections? Um, strep pyogenes, as a rule, is very sensitive to penicillin G, which is a very good thing, alhamdulillah. 
skin infection, you can't just use penicillin. You need to use a penicillinase resistant penicillin like dicloxacillin. And the reason is the two most common causes of skin infections, bacterial causes, are strep pyogenes and staph aureus. And to cover staph aureus, you need to use a penicillinase resistant penicillin. Now, thirdly, in the case of a severe skin infection, you can use clindamycin. And the reason for that is you want to stop any toxin production as quickly as possible. So clindamycin is a ribosomal inhibitor. And so you'll stop the toxin production too. And that is the end. Thank you for watching.